As Carl mentioned at the beginning, we have visitors in our presence. We appreciate your being with us and trust that you can worship with us in spirit and truth as we're doing here today in an acceptable way, and you will be edified. This part of our service, we come to sermon time. We devote our time to preaching the gospel of Christ as the New Testament church is instructed to do. And this morning, as we do that, I invite your undivided attention to our fullness in Christ. We have a lot of things in Christ, and we could name a lot of them. But what we're talking about this morning is one that's very important, and that is simply our fullness. Let me comment on the word fullness for just a moment because it's not a strange word to any of us. We're very familiar with the word fullness. If you're sitting at the table and you finished your meal and someone asks, can I pass you more? No, I'm full. Oh, you have fullness. Of course, that's a sense in which we talk about our fullness. We understand what that means in a physical sense. Or if you just left the gas pump and someone asks you, how much gas did you put in? I filled it up. These days, that's pretty good. <laughs> Your ta gas tank has fullness. We know what that means. And that in the physical sense. And obviously, when we talk about our fullness in Christ, we're talking about fullness in a spiritual sense. But they're parallel. One is analogous to the other in meaning. It's interesting, once you focus on that word, and I encourage you to do that sometime in your Bible reading, on the word fullness and how much it applies to your life as a Christian, how much is said in the New Testament about fullness, you will be impressed, especially as you read Ephesians and Colossians. This morning, our Bible basis of this concept is from Colossians chapter 2. I'd like to read these two verses. These are the two verses in their entirety. And we'll begin with these thoughts as the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and in him you are made full, who is the head of all principality and power. I would suggest to you that these two verses have a lot of important points that we need to know and remember. Not the least of which is the very leading thought in verse 9. For in him that is in Christ dwelleth all the fullness, so he has fullness, but what does the Apostle Paul say this fullness is? Deity. This is a direct affirmative statement of the deity of Christ. All the fullness of deity dwells in him. I don't know how anyone could mistake that doctrinal point in this verse. But we want to emphasize a part in verse 10 that we're doing, as you see in print. He said, in him, you are made full. You see the word arrangement that Paul has with the word fullness here. Christ is full, and we'll see this again in just a moment, but here he's affirming his fullness of deity, but it is he who fills you to full. And so he, in him, you are made full. I would make some observations with you about this. I would suggest the expression just in Christ is important because that suggests to us the place for our fullness. That's the only place it's possible. If we think we have fullness from someplace else, we're either very sadly mistaken or it's counterfeit. The only genuine fullness that is possible for anyone in a spiritual sense is from Jesus Christ, in Christ. Then secondly, the word full suggests to be filled to the utmost. If you fill something, whether it's your stomach with a meal or the gas tank with gasoline, it means it's filled to the top, to the utmost limits. And if something is made full, 
That word made indicates a making process. It has to be made. It is making you full. In addition to this, I would also suggest this very thought, if we get nothing else, inspires us to live up to our spiritual potential. It should be our desire to be full, to have this fullness in Christ. If we don't, we need to be working on it. In areas that we're lacking, we need to be improving and increasing. But the point is, this expression in and of itself inspires us to live up to our spiritual potential to get full. It deepens our love and appreciation for Jesus Christ because he is it. <laughs> he is the one. Without him, any fullness is impossible, as we've already mentioned, and so is anything else related to our religion or our relationship with God. And in general, we settle with this thought in a very general sense. Our life becomes more calm and more contented once we're able to wrap our minds around this fullness that we have in Christ. It, it calms us down. It makes us feel contentment that we otherwise can't have and should have. And so I'm going to ask a question, what is it that the New Testament teaches that we're full of? You know, every once in a while we kid each other and say, well, you're full of whatever expression we use, not vulgarity or anything of that nature, but just ways of saying that in very kidding terms. But seriously, what is it that we are full of in Christ? What is the potential for this fullness? Well, let's learn some things. I'm going to direct our attention to Ephesians, uh, the first chapter, and in verse 3. Paul starts this long paragraph by saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. This verse leads the book of Ephesians. And after his introductory salutation statements, Paul calls upon them and us to bless God. And that comes from the word eulogy, to eulogize God, to speak praise unto God, to speak highly of God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why, Paul? Why are you saying it in this verse? because he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. So what is it that we have, as stated in the last part of this verse, in Christ? We're full of every spiritual blessing. Now that's excluding none. That is all inclusive. <laughs> now think about that. We, we may think a few, yeah, uh, but Paul is affirming that our fullness involves every single one of them. Now, I want to show you something good about Ephesians 1, and I would encourage you to read Ephesians, the first chapter, sometime soon in your Bible reading, because as we come to the end of the chapter, which is represented here, Paul is still talking about fullness. Remember I told you earlier that fullness is a common occurrence. Paul said, and he, that is still referring to Christ, put all things in subjection under his feet. Well, that he, God, put all things in subjection under Christ's feet and gave him, that is Christ, to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. You notice the word fullness continuing at the end of the first chapter? Well, he's affirming that this Jesus Christ that he's been talking about in whom we have all spiritual blessings throughout this paragraph, God put all things in subjection under his feet. He is, the, he is sovereign over all. That was even affirmed in 
uh, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10, he is the head of all principality and power. He is the head of everything. But here Paul is focusing on the church. He is the head of the church. But Paul also wants it to be understood by those who are, which is, so that we have no mistaken identity here, his body. Now, we have a head, and every head, to be complete, needs a body. And so that's what Paul's language is developing here in our thinking. The head of the church is Jesus Christ. To make him full, to make him complete, he as the head needs the body. And so Paul identifies the church here in that way. As Christ's body, the church is his fullness. So he not only has fullness that is deity in all of its completeness, he has another fullness that you have a part of making. If you're a member of his church, you're a member of that body that is his fullness as the head. I, I hope that making that clear enough, you can appreciate that relationship that Paul is bringing out here. But the point here for us before we leave this passage, that Christ fills the church. Yes, we contribute to his fullness as the head. He would be incomplete without a body. So we complete his fullness. But Paul said in the last part of verse 23, which is his body. Now, read that with me again. The fullness of him, that is Christ, that fills all in all. The one who has fullness is filling. Filling who? <laughs> filling what? You and me. The church, individual members, individual disciples. And with what? Well, the leading thought in this paragraph is every spiritual blessing, in addition to some other things that we'll mention here in just a moment. But let's consider something else. What else are we full of in the fullness of Christ being in us? This is 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Apostle Paul, as you remember, relating his own personal relationship with the Lord in this matter of the thorn in the flesh. And he tells us why he had that. It was some physical physical infirmity, again, indefinite. We don't know exactly what it was. It's, a, it's an interesting study, but still uncertain. And he tells us that he prayed unto the Lord three times. Remember, he said thrice in the most translations, perhaps in more up-to-date language, three times. Well, the Lord answered him. He said, Paul, I'm not going to take that thorn away. You're going to keep it. And that's maybe the way he answers some of your prayers. I'm not going to remove that from you. I want you to keep it. And he may have a purpose in doing that. He had a purpose with Paul. He said unto me, my grace, if you read the passage with me, is sufficient for thee, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul continues and, and, and lets us know that he gladly takes pleasure in weakness. Why would anyone take pleasure in weakness? For this reason. Because Christ's power is present in him in a very obvious sense, in a very helpful way. And that's his point in that what is in him, what he's full of, in whatever this thorn in the flesh was, whether it was his vision, whether it was some a disability in some other way, we don't know. But he had within him the fullness of something that helped him get through that, and that was, as the Lord said, it's made perfect, it's made complete in you, it's full in you, and what I'm talking about is my power. Do you think about having the power of Christ in you? This is not miraculous here. This is every day. Daily life matters. That the Lord, whatever our weakness may be, whatever our infirmity may be, 
Christ would help us by saying, my power is made perfect in your weakness if you depend upon me. Now, along with this, let's read Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. This is when the Apostle Paul is making a prayer here for the Ephesians and for all of us. He said he's bending his knee, he's expressing this prayer that you may be strengthened with power. Now notice the language. Through his spirit in the inward man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now the indwelling of Christ in our hearts through faith is important. That's a result. But I want us to note the top two lines in this passage, if you will, with power. What power? Through him, through Christ. What do you intend for it to do? That you may be strengthened. So this power has a purpose. It's not to show off. It's not to say, hey, look at me. No, it's to strengthen you. And it's to strengthen your inward man, your inward person. It perhaps is even unknown but it is inward, it is spiritual in nature, and it empowers you spiritually, as Paul said, through the, his spirit in the inward man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. I would suggest to you, when we ask and study our fullness in Christ, we have to think about the fullness of his power as he gives it unto us on a daily basis that we might be able to be strengthened with it for our daily needs. And that brings me to a chart that I prepared to help us make specific applications. Full of power for inward strength to do what? Well, let me make some suggestions. Resist temptation. All of us are going to be tempted at some time or another. And I tell you, if you try to do it on your own, human weakness is very weak. And in the face of some of the powerful temptations in the world today, Satan is overcoming a lot of people. So we need this power for this inward strength to resist the devil. We need it to control our tongue. Because sometimes we lose control of ourselves or have a tendency and want to say things that we shouldn't say. And so we need inward strength. Well, if we're full of power for that, we can do that. We can deal with problems. We can control our anger. We can face the uncertain future. And we have one, don't we? In a lot of ways, we have an uncertain future. It's always uncertain. <laughs> We're not trying to say that it's never that we know the future, because we don't. But when we try to figure things out, study history to, to see what's going to happen, and history, you know, all those principles, we don't know the future. Do we have to face it? Yes. You have to face the future. You have to live your life. You have to be a good family. You have to be a good Christian. You have to be a good church member. Well, what helps you face the future, the power that is perfected in you from Christ for inward strength. And sometimes just to cover a lot of things, just to get through the day. <laughs> you ever have days like that? Just, it just seems like some days are just that way. Just If things are going to happen, they seem to all happen <laughs> at once. And sometimes we just need to, instead of feeling like, oh my, woe is me and begin to focus on ourselves and how bad it is for me. Let's get out of ourselves and start thinking about other people. And get out of ourselves and start thinking about what we can do to be a source of encouragement to others and just to get through our times and help others get through their difficult times. A closing thought, let's join the Apostle Paul and say in Philippians chapter four, verse 13, I can do all things in him that strengthen me, whether it's one of these that we have listed or something that's more unique to your life that's special. Join with him in the power that he gives to strengthen you in your inward 
spiritual person that he may dwell in your heart and you can say, I can do all things in him. Well, another thing, something else we're full of, <laughs> or should be, is a statement that Jesus made. This is his personal statement in John 15. If you good Bible student, a good Bible reader, and you know the content of John 15, you go through the vine and the branches section in the first part. But he comes to verse 11 and he said, These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. There he's teaching about fullness, that something in you may be full or have fullness. And what is it? Well, it's not hard to identify. He said, I, I've taught these things. I have spoken them unto you that my personal joy, what I experience in my being, can be in you. Now, when you think about that, how special that is. And especially that last statement in this verse that your joy can be full, fullness. Our fullness in Christ involves his own personal joy. I think of what the Apostle John, which wrote, of course, the Gospel of John 15 and records what the Lord said then, but later toward the end of the first century when he's writing his, these books, Revelation, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 4, he, he enumerates several things about being witnesses to verify and validate Christ. These things we write unto you that your joy may be made full. He's writing about the Lord, and, and here he's just simply affirming that's the purpose of what we write and what you should read is because these things make your joy Full. It fills the tank <laughs> of joy. I think of Paul's statement, to, but in this verse in chapter, or some people may get only parts of salvation. Salvation to a certain degree, less than others might have, others more. Is that so? Well, according to this statement, this answers all of that. It's absolutely not. Because Christ is able to give this salvation to the uttermost. That means it will never end, and it is always to the fullest extent. Never any reservation, never any limitation on its duration. If you're saved, it is forever, as long as you remain faithful. And it is all the salvation that anyone will ever receive, anytime, anywhere, through him. Because he does this for them that draw near unto God through him. You remember the Apostle Peter um, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. I don't have this verse on the screen, but he, he made an important point that relates to this because they had healed this lame man in chapter 3. And Peter wants them to know that it was in the name of Jesus, who is now living, that they were able to perform that miracle and heal that man who had never walked. And he said, let me tell you about him. In none other is there salvation. For there's no other name under heaven that is given among men wherein we must be saved. Again, it's in him, it's to the uttermost, it is full with the fullness. When I think of this, I think of Hebrews chapter 6 and in verse 4, and I have part of it highlighted. I want you to see that highlight with me. For as touching those who were once enlightened 
and tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit. Now there's a whole section there. We're not gonna, it's not pertinent to what we're talking about right here, but he's talking about those who fall away. There's not another sacrifice. There's not an, uh, another dispensation that God's going to send another son or something of that nature. This is it. <laughs> and so if we fall away, truly, it's impossible to be saved. For there's nothing else to come. Now, we can make come to our senses and repent. But as long as we're able to believe and repent, God will forgive us. Absolutely. But the Hebrew writer makes it clear. But here he's talking about how, how can you believe that touching those who were once enlightened, they, they were enlightened by the truth of the gospel of Christ, and they knew it, and they even tasted of the heavenly gift. I like that expression because, in other words, that salvation to the othermost can be test, tasted. Have you tasted salvation? Uh, we don't mean physically, but it should be to the fullest extent that you can feel the reality of being saved and taste it. It's a heavenly gift. It's the gift of God and uh, excess partakers of the Holy Spirit. Well, back where we started. We would emphasize Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 again. In him, remember, dwelleth all the fullness of deity, the Godhead, bodily. It's all in him. And it was in him here upon the earth in his body. But in him, you, you are made full. Okay, let's, let's appreciate that. Let's take that and try to understand that. Wrap our minds around that and see how that can, can help us. And the way it has helped us, we have seen in this lesson from these passages. He fills us to full with every spiritual blessing. He fills us to full with power for inward strength sufficient. He fills us to full with his personal joy and he fills us to full with the salvation to the uttermost that we can actually taste it. Some people spit it out, and that's sad. Some people don't appreciate the gracious taste of salvation of the heavenly gift and actually discard it. And sadly enough, some of the Hebrews were doing that in the first century, and that's why the book of Hebrews was written to help prevent that from happening. But we want to close with this thought, the Apostle Paul in chapter three, Ephesians three, where we were just a minute ago in verse 19, that all of this is being said and all of this is being prayed for us to know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge that you may be filled unto all the fullness of God. Appreciate that thought. That's not something we take lightly. It is something that we should think about more often. Our fullness in Christ. And what the Apostle Paul is doing in this passage in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 19 is praying for them that they would know the love of Christ. And what he, he lets us know is no matter how well you know the love of Christ, it still extends beyond your knowledge. But I'm going to get more knowledge. No matter how much knowledge you get, it's going to extend beyond. It passeth all knowledge. And that shows the unfathomable nature of the love of Christ. That, that shouldn't discourage us from trying to understand and know the love of Christ. But that is written that way to place emphasis upon how much he loves you, how much he loves us. Why? That we may be filled with some worldly stuff, glitter, glamour of the world? Absolutely not. 
that's not your purpose for living. <laughs> that's not the reason you were born. You were born to be filled with the fullness of God so you can go to heaven. So let's do it. Let's be encouraged by these statements that come from these passages and grow in our love and appreciation and devotion to our Lord and Savior. But I would close before we sing this song of invitation by simply saying, if there's anyone here who has not tasted of salvation to the uttermost, or salvation in Christ, then we, we want you to go to the source, go to the Bible, go to the New Testament, the teaching of Christ, the truth of the gospel, and he teaches us, the apostles teaches us, that we must believe in him, repent of our sins, confess our faith, and be baptized for the remission of our sins, Acts 2.38, or Acts 22.16, to wash our sins away. Of course, the washing is by the blood of Jesus Christ. If we can help anyone here today, let us know. While together we stand and sing the song that's been announced.